Well, I'm very excited today to have Dr. Scott Stripling, uh, a good friend and an archaeologist and really a leader in the world, I think, of uh, biblical archaeology. And not afraid or ashamed to say he's involved with bi biblical archaeology. Isn't that correct, Dr. Stripling? <laughs> That's my favorite topic. So I love to engage um, the believer and the skeptic on that topic. Right. And we're going to talk today about Shiloh, which is a, a passion of yours. But before we get there, I always like to talk with people about, well, how did you get here? You know, I just would like to have just a little bit of your testimony of your life. I understand that you came to faith as a teenager, didn't you? Well, I had known the Lord from my childhood, but I went through a period of about five years of, I guess you would say, rebellion or, or wildness. And uh, I did have a pretty radical uh, conversion or recommitment of my life to Christ uh, just before my senior year in high school. And I got involved in ministry real quickly, um, studied, went to seminary, earned a couple of de master's degrees along the way. And when I got ready to do doctoral work, I just thought, how much more finally can I split these theological hairs than they're already split? My sense was that when there was a gap in our understanding of the biblical text, that it had a lot to do with the material culture then and there. And I really got drawn deeply into that world, and I felt like I could make a, a difference in, in that area. And so I'm privileged that I still get to preach most Sundays in different people's pulpits, but I don't have to deal with any of the problems yeah. that the pastors yeah. deal with. But um, I was able to, you know, dig, dig deeply into the world, no pun intended, d deeply into the world of biblical archaeology and excavate several sites on the highlands of Israel. And I'm excited about talking uh, with you about it today. You used a word called material culture. Let's just talk a little bit about that word because, you know, it's a technical term, uh, but what is material culture and, and how does that help us understand the Bible? Tim, sometimes we think about general revelation and special revelation, like the the Bible is, is special revelation and creation is a general revelation that God has given us. The material culture fits right in between those two. Maybe it's even a third level uh, from an archaeological perspective, a record that was left behind of what God did historically, of his story, what the Germans would call Heilsgeschichte or the Sitzem Leben, the the, the verisimilitude of the cultures that were left behind. And when we can excavate them and then synchronize that with the biblical text, we often find that there's, there's a great consistency. In our first film, Patterns of Evidence, when we looked at the evidence for the Semitic group in Egypt, you know, the evidence is for Joseph and for the Semitic people that were not Egyptians. And then later on, when we look at uh, Joshua and we see at Jericho, we see the burn layers that Dr. Bryant Wood talked about. We see the pattern of evidence that's there that really uh, testifies to the truth of God's word. And that's why I like, that's why I love patterns and the patterns approach. And I know that that's, uh, you know, I've, I, I was <laughs> excited to kind of have a pattern, you know, grab onto that name patterns of evidence. It, and some people said, hey, that's a terrible name. But I mean, when you think about it, it's the scientific approach. But it's that God actually says, he, God even uses the word patterns at times. He says, uh, the pattern that I showed to Moses, you know, uh, he right. was supposed to, to design, uh, the, uh, I think it was the uh, tabernacle, wasn't it, according to the, the pattern? Yeah. And here we're going to be talking about the tabernacle. So <laughs> for anyone who doesn't know the background, you know, the tabernacle was created. The pattern was given to Moses at Mount Sinai and they built it there. And then later on, we're going to talk about Shiloh because later on it comes to Shiloh. So tell us the significance of Shiloh and the tabernacle there. Okay. Well, you're right. Uh, it was at at Mount Sinai that it was constructed. We even know the names of the people who constructed it. God specifically told Moses to choose uh, Bezalel and Aholiab, and he even gives us their, their father's names. And so they're very clear who they were, and they were chosen because of their skill, their craftsmanship, and they had the honor of constructing the Mishkan, the tabernacle, which would be essentially be the, the portable house of God, the dwelling of God that would then uh, lead them through the wilderness for those 40 years and on into the promised land. Um, Joshua 18.1 is our first clear mention of Shiloh in the biblical text, and it says that Joshua had the tabernacle erected at Shiloh, which is in the tribal territory of Ephraim, when, and Joshua was from the, the tribe of Ephraim, but it was also centrally located. And it was also there that he allotted this, the seven tribes that had not yet received their, their tribal lands. He allotted them uh, to them there.
question I have is Shiloh ever mentioned outside the Bible? Uh, oftentimes terms are used, you know, and, and but they're just, you know, biblical, they're, they're, they're in the Bible. But uh, is there any cross reference to, to Shiloh outside of the Bible? I sometimes chuckle when I'm asked that question because we do study the Mesopotamian literature and the Egyptian literature, and we, we try to glean everything we can about the ancient cultures. But in this case, Shiloh is not mentioned outside the Bible. We don't have it in the Amarna tablets or, or any other source to date anyway. And so when people sort of pejoratively say, oh, you know, with well, Stripling and ABR, they're just you know, they're, they're using the Bible and trying to find correlations. Well, we have no other text, Tim. I mean, if it was in the Amarna letters, then I would also be looking there, but it's only mentioned in the Bible. Does Shiloh, the name Shiloh, have a meaning? Shiloh is very similar to Shalom. So Shalom would mean peace. Shiloh, Shiloh, uh, Shiloh would mean tranquility. Okay. So a place of tranquility, and which is interesting because the sacrificial system was so violent, so bloody, I mean, that operated at Shiloh for over three centuries. And it's just such a contrast between the name and the reality of what it takes to cover our sins. Well, if you think about it, though, let's just think about that for a moment. If you've been carrying your sin around for a year <laughs> and you show up, uh, you left potentially feeling tranquility. Right. I mean, take Hannah, for example. Hannah and Elkanah come to Shiloh. She's a desperate woman. I mean, when she's crying out to God, it's not some pretty Sunday school prayer. She's sobbing. She's heaving. Uh, she calls out to God. And I think many people who came there looking for expiation from their sins uh, left as transformed because right. of the shedding of blood. Remember Leviticus 17, without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sin. For people who aren't as familiar, because there's been less people reading the uh, Old Testament than the New Testament, uh, uh, there's a trend there. But for for because Shiloh is mentioned in uh, what part of the scriptures and this event uh, that you're that we're going to be talking about there. What does the Bible tell us then about Shiloh? Okay, so here's the main passages: Joshua 18:1, which I just quoted, and then also in Judges, the middle chapters of Judges, you have another reference, and it's very specific geographically. In fact, uh, Edward Robinson used that passage in Judges and just literally followed the geographical indicators, and it led him right to Shiloh. And again, that points to the fact that the Bible is a real historical source. Uh, a later writer would have no way of knowing that level of specificity. We also have mentions in the book of Jeremiah uh, when Jerusalem is about to be destroyed, God is telling Jeremiah 7:12, go now to Shiloh and see what I did there where I first caused my name to dwell. In other words, that was my home. That's where the tabernacle was. And I allowed them to be destroyed. So don't think I won't do the same thing to, to Jerusalem. And there's a prophet named, uh, named uh, Achel from that time period too that's mentioned during the time of uh, Jeroboam. And then lastly, Psalm 78 gives us an important mention of Shiloh, and it hints at the destruction of Shiloh, which we'll talk about some today. Okay. Now, there are thousands of archaeological sites and uh, it, throughout Israel. I mean, I, I notice, uh, you know, when we're driving on the highway, you can see different mounds and tells. They're, they're just everywhere. Uh, so what sets Shiloh apart? Uh, why does Shiloh matter? <laughs> Well, if I were to give a true-false question to you and say, okay, well, not true-false, let's say multiple choice. How many tells are there in Israel? Is it 5,000? Is it 10? Is it 15? Is it 20? Or is it 30? What would you say? 1,000, that is. I would say 30,000. <laughs> and you nailed it. That's yeah. right. It's, uh, it's about 30,000 archaeological sites just in Israel. That's not counting Jordan and Lebanon and Egypt and all these other places. So they're everywhere. Your question is, why is Shiloh different? What sets it apart? And what sets it apart is that God lived there, Tim, for three centuries. Mm -hmm. So a little over three centuries, the, the Mishkan is there. The Ark of the Covenant is there. The sacrificial system operates there. It was Israel's first capital. I mean, Jerusalem is still a pagan city for centuries, while Shiloh is the center of Israelite life and worship. So there, there can never be another first. And so Shiloh will always be important because of that. So was the, Shiloh is the location of the first capital for the Israelite people. 
That's right. And it's because that's where the presence of God dwelt. I mean, how much more plain can the text be that God is dwelling in the tabernacle, in the Holy of Holies at ancient Shiloh? And as you know, we've begun to uncover a, a good bit of evidence already that reflects the cultic tabernacle system that, that operated there. You have co-authored a new book by Zondervan, Five Views on the Exodus. Oh, let's ask your, your view. When did the Exodus occur and when was the tabernacle erected then at Shiloh? Okay, well, obviously I've got an opinion or else I wouldn't have written the chapter, but here's the book, the Zondervan text, part of their Counterpoint series, Five Views on the Exodus. And um, I wrote chapter one, which is the early date or the biblical date of the Exodus, which is 1446. So the other authors didn't um, question that that is the biblical date or what the biblical writers wrote. What they maybe argued with me about was that's not what they meant. They meant to say something else. But does the Bible point to the mid 15th century? or 1446 is the date of the Exodus, it, it clearly does. The five passages and lots of archaeological evidence, which I outline uh, in the text. So that would be, in my view, the 18th Egyptian dynasty, most likely during the reign of Amenhotep II. When was the tabernacle erected? Well, let's say when, when they exit out of Egypt and they come to Mount Sinai, um, after this great Red Sea crossing, then they, they come to Mount Sinai, um, that's going to only be, it's still going to be about 1446, 1445, thereabouts, uh, when Bezalel and Aholiab, and maybe with Aaron and Moses' guidance, uh, construct the tabernacle using the things, much of the spoils that they had taken out of Egypt. And a lot of these guys were uh, mine workers. We we have Semitic inscriptions in these mines at places like Serebet and Halim and, and the Wadi al-Nazb and places like that. So clearly these Semitic people are working within the mines, and so they have smelting skills and, and other skills that are going to be used then in the building of the tabernacle. How long was the tabernacle at Shiloh? Okay, so let's say that they arrive at Shiloh around 1400, because it's a 1446 exit, there's a 40-year wilderness wandering, and then a con an initial conquest of about six years puts them arriving at 1400, which incidentally is recognized by everyone in archaeology as a as a turning point. Uh, we go from, in their traditional chronology and any revised chronology, you're going to go from, say, Late Bronze one into Late Bronze two at the year 1400. So it's clearly recognized that that's a turning point, and that just happens to be the same point that the Bible places the Israelites arriving there. So let's say that Joshua 18.1 takes place around 1400 B.C., um, the tabernacle is erected. How long does it stand? Well, the the um, Seder Olam, which is a second century AD document, tells us that it was there for 369 years. And so you'll often see that number in print. Um, if you visit Shiloh, you'll see signage that says 369 years, and you'll see that quoted in some sources. That is not consistent with the internal biblical chronology, which would give us closer to uh, just a little over three centuries, because the, the destruction layer that we are excavating at Shiloh matches very, very clearly with the biblical date. So around 1075 BC. So I'm going to say a little over three centuries. This is the kind of the part that lots of people want to know. What evidence is or what evidence are you finding when, when you're digging there? Okay, awesome. Well, um, I have some pottery here that I'll hold up um, from the period of the tabernacle at Shiloh. This is the classic Israelite collared rim jar. And so if you are wanting a telltale sign of, of Israelites, here it is. So it's from the period that, again, that we would call Iron One. If you go down a little further, there would be a, a ridge right here on the vessel. But you can see the accession code on the inside, how we keep track of it. This would be a big pithos or a big storage jar. You can see kind of a potter's mark here as well. And then we have a, a cooking vessel here, classic profile and what we would call a flange. So you have diagnostic features from each time period and those enable us to date vessels to different times. Here the flange is even more pronounced. You know, this would be from the time of Eli, Hannah and Elkanah and so forth. Um, 
so there's a, a lot of pottery, uh, many thousands of pieces of pottery that we have excavated and we've documented from the period. But there's a lot more than that. So let me briefly run through them. We have storage rooms that appear to run the perimeter on the inside of the fortification wall. So the fortification wall was built by the Amorites or the Canaanites. It was already there when Joshua arrived. And on the inside of that, they constructed these storage rooms. And those storage rooms are full of this pottery. I mean, this came out of one of those storage rooms. No other site in Israel has that. So we just have to stop and think about that for a second. Why does only Shiloh have storage rooms lining the, the interior perimeter? Well, what did they do at Shiloh when people like Hannah and Elkanah came? They paid their tithe. They brought agricultural commodity. They couldn't write checks. They couldn't make secure online donations. So they brought barley and figs and, you know, agricultural commodity. And what would we expect to find would be storage rooms. What are we finding? Storage rooms. And no other site in Israel has that um, to date. Yeah, that's a pattern right there, isn't it, when you think about it? Uh, it's a really imp important yeah. pattern of evidence. So what you're showing then by, by this is that the Bible says that people came to bring offerings. And you've got the unusual, you call it verisimilitude, is it that? What, <laughs> you know, it's, it's this connection between the fact that the scriptures are telling us that at Shiloh people brought offerings. And what do you find? You find these storage rooms that have vessels. Why would there be so many vessels and so many storage rooms there where you never see it yeah. anywhere else, right? That's right. <laughs> so that's one. And then there's a lot more. For example, we have we are excavating ceramic palm granites. And I, I do have a replica here on my desk. I'll, I'll hold up. The uh, palm granite was uh, one of the seven sacred fruits that the Israelites had that God had promised them. But it's the only one that went into the presence of God. And uh, you can see the, the calyx on the bottom mm -hmm. and the bulb on the top. So this is what a baby palm granite looks like. And the high priest had not only bells on the hem of his garment, but he had pomegranates as well. And so it, when he went into the presence of God, he brought pomegranates with him. Solomon's temple later had 200 pomegranates that adorned it also. So it's only the pomegranate that is sacred and represents God's fecundity, his great potential for replication and reproduction and fertility and so forth. So the Bible says that there were pomegranates pomegranates, and I don't mean the actual fruit, but the representation at Shiloh. And what are we finding? Ceramic pomegranates there with hooks on them, by the way. I don't know if you can see this, but there's a hook there. Yeah. And, and is, it, is, so, it that, is it about that size? Yeah. J slightly bigger than this, but yeah. uh, it, it was intact. So yeah. there was no doubt what it was. Now, I can't tell you that this hung from Eli's garment because I don't have any proof of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but the there were thing there were pomegranates hanging and we do have them uh this could have been from a stand of some kind like a tree of life stand or something but the point is these have only been found in israel at levitical sites mm -hmm. so for example yokniam explain what a levitical site is for people who don't know okay so what levites are living there the levites were given certain cities in mm -hmm. in the different tribal inheritances since levi did not get its own land you had levitical cities within each tribe and so because they were priests they were they were the one tribe of the 12 right. that became priests and so what you're saying is that these pomegranates the bible tells us that they were supposed to put them on their hems of their garments and this is a Levitical, yes. this is a Levitical location, right? This is where the, the sacrifice are happening. And what are you finding but pomegranates with hooks? <laughs> right. <laughs> so it begins to line up. And of course, there's a lot more. Um, our last season in 2019, because we were not able to dig in 2020 because of the global COVID situation. But in 2019, we excavated three horns from a demolished four-horned altar very similar to the one at, at Beersheba, right in the same area where the pomegranates are coming from. So, you know, you're talking now about a, a, a horned altar, like, like the Bible describes. We have a destruction matrix that is that these came out of that I was able to date using not only pottery, but also carbon dating to 1075 BC, which was the exact date that, that we expected it to be. That's the Philistine destruction uh, of Shiloh. We also, Tim, have a, a bone deposit. So it's what we would call a favisa or a bone deposit. 
And so we have thousands of bones with late Bronze Age pottery mixed in with them. Late Bronze II, which is the period that the Israelites were first there, when Joshua lives another decades after the tabernacles uh, erected. So this pottery is from the time of, of Joshua, and it's mixed in with these bones. And the interesting thing is these are bones only from the biblical sacrificial system, and they are bones that are predominantly from the right side of the animal. So you understand what I'm saying? You have maybe 65% of the bones from the right side of the animal, 35% from the left side of the animal. That's illogical. It makes no sense unless one happens to be a Bible reader. And what do we read in Leviticus 7? That the right side of the animal is the priest portion. So what's that big word we learned earlier? <laughs> the verisimilitude, okay? Yeah. The Bible describes a sacrificial system, and we begin to find a pattern, a verisimilitude, that is very representative of that system. Archaeology is about interpretation. And there are a lot of archaeologists that don't believe in the Bible, don't believe in God. And so what ends up happening is, is they tend to you know, sort of diminish these connections. Uh, which is disappointing right. uh, because you could say, well, <laughs> there's a pattern right here, uh, or they'll come up with other ways to explain it. But, you know, I was just thinking about, you know, Shiloh patterns of evidence. I mean, when you think about it, you've got so many different little patterns. It would make, it would make very easy for me to make a film about that pattern because you would okay, say- Okay, ladies and gentlemen, you heard it here first in this interview. Right. Tim Mahoney has agreed to do a patterns of evidence movie at Shiloh because I've got more. Yeah, well, I'm excited about it. Well, I, I'll tell you what, <laughs> our plan is, once again, our calling with the Patterns of Evidence Foundation, I mean, the, our calling, very, very, very unique calling. Uh, I didn't know this would happen, but you know, the films that we've been making are really testifying to the truth of God's word. And how do we do that? We say, well, what does God's word say? What does the Bible say? And can we find a pattern for it? That's why I need, you know, uh, Scott, I need guys like you and and Brian Wood and others uh, in the you know that have have found patterns and I just my skiff, my gifting is being a filmmaker uh, is is to and, and and film is the language of the culture right now so right. you know it's it's harder for people to take the time to read uh, right. so so well and plus we still have much of the world is an oral culture uh, much of the world is still illiterate and so film is so powerful because it bypasses yeah. um, all of those roadblocks that maybe we have presuppositionally put up and it, it goes right into their inner being. Um, let me go back for a second to um, what you said about other archaeologists, because Israel Finkelstein excavated Shiloh in the 1980s from 80 to 84. Of course, he's a renowned um, minimalist. And he was the one who excavated, first excavated this bone deposit. We're going to finish excavating it this year. But uh, Finkelstein noted it, and he noted that the majority of the bones were from the right side of the animal. But that was it. There was no interpretation because he's not a Bible reader. <laughs> um, so, you know, maybe he knows his Mesopotamian literature better than me or his Egyptian literature. I don't know if he does or not. But uh, certainly we were able to recall Leviticus 7 and then to make that, that connection. Right. So in that part right. of the world, Tim, listen, the Bible is our go-to source. When this stuff comes out of the ground like this, it's mute. It doesn't, it doesn't tell us anything. It has to be interpreted. And so we bring then a lifetime of experiences, uh, the, you know, the libraries through which we've read and researched and all the things we've excavated come to bear to enable us to interpret this evidence. Well, that's the reason why we've been asking people to be thinkers, right? Uh, I mean, right. I think when you, that's the reason why it's so important to have different points of view, because once you start to say, well, what makes the most sense? What happened here? What, what do we have? We have a historical document, the Bible, which is, is chronicling God's acting through history. And, and then we find, we come to this place and we find uh, a powerful pattern. So let me ask you this, because this location isn't an easy place to get a, you know, permission to dig, right? How, how did you get the dig permit at this location? It's an interesting question. I'm going to give you one more piece of the pattern, and then I'll answer that. Um, oh, okay. There's more. Excavating. Well, I was saving the best for last. Um, okay. We have been excavating a monumental building from the period of the tabernacle. 
that orients east-west. And I don't have enough of it excavated yet to be positive, but the palm granites and the altar horns and all the sacrificial material is all around this, this building. And that is our main goal then for this coming season is to complete the excavation of this. It's, it's definitely related to the tabernacle. It could be an ancillary building uh, of the tabernacle, but it, it, so far it looks like it orients east-west and the dimensions look very similar to the dimensions of the tabernacle. And so uh, I'm not claiming yet that we have the platform of the tabernacle, but I'll know this summer uh, if we do or not. And if we do, then uh, we're gonna have a fascinating story to tell the world. What, what would the dimensions of the tabernacle be? I don't have them right in front of me, and I don't okay. want to quote them incorrectly, but uh, but they're they're in the text. And so what we did is we took what it appeared this building was from the portions we had excavated, very large uh, building, and we know that there was a, a permanency that happened. Read First Samuel, the first three chapters of First Samuel, you can see the language is changing from temporary to permanent language. Instead of the curtains of the tabernacle, now you have the doors and the walls of the tabernacle. And so uh, it appears that there's a, a more permanent structure that's built. So um, if it if our building has the dimensions that we think it does, mm -hmm. then it matches, matches the description in the Bible. So uh, we didn't make it up. We didn't bury it there, but we're sure happy to be excavating it. What's the process of getting a, a, a dig permit for people who don't know really what you know what do you do if there's 30,000 dig sites how do you get permission because there's politics involved sometimes you know Oh there's always politics you think American politics are dicey but when you get in the Jerusalem and that's the epicenter of of the political world um it takes a lot um I write about this in chapter 1 of my book The Trial and the Truth you can get it through the, the Patterns website. I write about it in chapter one, the whole process, but I'll quickly run you through it. Number one, the archaeologist himself is going to have to have the proper experience and academic credentials and the right relationships, because in the Middle East, everything happens out of relationships. So you will have already been working there for a number of years and meeting people. Um, you will have to do initial proposals and surveys, raise money, uh, bring a team together, establish protocols, publish those protocols, um, and then probably do an initial survey or probe that the Antiquities Authority then would okay. And so in Israel, there's different entities. You've got the Israeli Antiquities Authority, which is the primary uh, body that would issue licenses. Then you have what's called the Civil Administration of Judea and Samaria, which is a branch of the IAA that deals with the highlands. And that's where, of course, our area of research interest lies within Judea, Samaria, what some people call the West Bank um, or Area C. And they all have political connotations, as you know. And then there's the Palestinian Authority. And so in places like Jericho um, and Hebron, and other places, then the Palestinian Authority has has the right to issue a, a permit. And then there's Parks Authority in some cases that can as well. And then some of the churches, like the Franciscans, own sites like Capernaum, and they have some, some of their own autonomy as well uh, in that regard. Now, in our case, um, the Antiquities Authority knew of our work. We'd been working there for many years in the highlands of Israel at Kerbet Nisia and Kerbet el Makader in our, in our research on the biblical city of Ai. And so they knew the quality of our work, and they basically asked me if I was interested, and I was, was very interested because our dig at, at Kerbet el Makader was coming to an end. And so with the permission of local landowners and the licensing and then everything else in place, that's how it gets off the ground. Once again, we're in a crisis for a biblical worldview, uh, where we've got lots That's of right. different worldviews that are coming here. There's there's people who are saying that the Bible is a myth and these events didn't happen, and that weighs heavily on a lot of young people uh, because they go off to university and and they are discouraged. I mean, I've heard this story over and over and over again uh, with what we're doing, and I know that that. Uh, that the type of work that you're doing and other archaeologists are doing are are bringing, I think, uh, what's the, what's the V word? Verisimilitude. Verisimilitude. Yeah. Right. What is the definition of verisimilitude? <laughs> I mean, it's it's uh, it's a consistency between what you would expect to find and what you actually find. Yeah. Yeah. And so what? We're, and I just call it a pattern of evidence. <laughs> 
What I've heard is that you are a very talented and organized archaeologist. And I mean, I'm, I'm bragging on you a little bit. When you launch a new excavation, I mean, when you're digging, it's messy, but you keep things very, very organized. So let's just talk about a question about what steps do you take to launch a new excavation, like what you're doing at Shiloh? Okay, well, thanks for the, the kind words. We certainly try to be organized. You know, it's, it's extremely complex. We're dealing with thousands of years of, of history and the layering and the, the responsibility that I have as an archaeologist is I only get one bite at the apple. I mean, we cannot replicate the experiment. I can't say, oops, I made a mistake and then go back and redo it because we have destroyed the evidence in the process of, of excavating. Now, many times we can publish it, we can restore buildings and so forth, but we can't redo an excavation. So we try to be as organized as we can. Uh, the first thing that we would do directly to your question is um, establish a grid. So in today's world, we would take drones, for example, fly them, get a lot of high quality footage. And if there was an existing grid, like at Shiloh, there was a small portion of the site that had been excavated prior, then we want to look at that grid and find out if it was done correctly because there's magnetic north and there's true north. And so sometimes the grids are off and then make any adjustments that we need to make and expand that grid so that as we begin to mark out what we are going to excavate, we know exactly where it lies within the square and we can measure from there, we establish benchmarks at each square. So we know that we are 700 meters above sea level and that's marked very clearly on that, that square. All measurements then are taken off of that benchmark so we know where in the square it was found. And we had been, in, in our dig at Shiloh, I use a, a color system. So each square has its own color. We've got the orange team, the red team, the blue team, the purple team, and so forth. And after they have excavated and after they have dry sifted that material to check to make sure nothing was missed, then it's dumped into these colored mesh bags that are taken down to our wet sifting station. And that wet sifting station is state of the art. And so this has never been done in the field the way that we're doing it, where 100% of the material is washed. And it slows you down a little bit, but we're fortunate to have a big team and people that are able to, to do this type of work. And again, I don't get a second shot at it, so I don't want to miss anything. Right. Now, what, what we're finding in wet sifting, Tim, is revolutionary. Um, we are finding that in the past, archaeologists were discarding about 75% of the evidence. It was in their dump piles. And we know because we've gone back to old dump piles and wet sifted them, and we found more scarabs, bula, seal impressions, uh, beads, coins, etc., than they did. It's all in their dump. So if somebody excavates a site and says, well, we, we didn't find evidence that matches the Bible, well, maybe not when we're throwing away 75% of the evidence. Yeah. And so this is just critically important. And so we're trying, I've, I've now written my first articles on this and I'm making you know presentations at conferences and trying to empower others with the same technology that we have brought to bear in the field. It's like panning for gold in a sense where you're trying to get the, the, all the, the stuff that doesn't belong there. Uh, and you're looking for the gems, as it were. When I've watched certain sites, because some sites are, are at a place where there's no water. I mean, they're very, very difficult. As an example, do you have a well where you're getting your water from? The, the ancient spring, Ain Sailun, the, it's about one kilometer from the Tell, and that's where they got their water in antiquity, was from, from the, the spring. So, of course, we've got pipes that bring it up to us now. In antiquity, they had to carry it up every day. But yeah, it comes from Ain Sailun, the Shiloh Spring. Sites that don't have water, and I've excavated a site like that, so I know that it's difficult, but I feel so strongly about it now that if I had it to do all over again at Kerbet el Makater, I would have brought in water trucks, um, you know, and of course, money solves a lot of your problems. So yeah. With, yeah. with money, we could bring in every day a water truck and we would have washed um, because it's just that critically important. And, you know, Tim, as, as an evangelical, if I make a mistake, then it's kind of like, well, it's because I'm an evangelical. But if someone else makes a mistake, it's, well, we all make mistakes. It's one of those things. 
So this has forced us to be excellent, and I think that's a good thing. I think that's the reason why you have such a great reputation, because you have really worked with your protocols. And one of the things I heard of it is you, how you deal with, let's talk a little bit about the conservation and restoration of a site. Because what, you're, what we know is that, I don't know if anyone knows this, but when, when you dig a site, it's gonna only happen one time, right? I mean, once you, once you destroy a layer, it's gone. And so er, that's why it's been so interesting to see the technology that you've used with your drone photography. I think you're using some type of infrared photography. Mm -hmm. You're doing everything to document because once again, if you dig it, it's no longer, no one else will, in the world will ever have a chance to have dug that your record right. so what you're doing is you're just identifying everything that you find right and then That's later right. on you can come back and interpret what you believe right. these finds are telling you it's true we can't reconstruct everything but since i save soil samples from every locus you literally could 50 years from now go back and get my soil samples that we have saved and do new scientific testing on the soil and you know do later analysis. So we're trying to cover all of our bases as much as, as we can. The conservation is in my view critically important because it's not just about us, it's about how the story is told. And that's what Jeremiah 712 says to me, go now to Shiloh, see what I did there where I first caused my name to dwell. And so we wanna tell, tell that story well and we want future generations to be able to come and to visit Shiloh, those walls will fall apart if they're not conserved. And so we invest uh, a lot of money and time uh, and expertise because I have two of the, the world's best conservationists that have trained our team, and that would be Lane Rittmeyer and Orna Cohen. And so we have come up with a system that, I mean, the Antiquities Authority, they're, they're coming and learning from what we're doing because we, Let's say we take a wall, we clean all the soil out of it that we can with trowels and brushes. Then we bring in a power hose and we power wash that ancient wall. Then we let it dry overnight. And then we have massive, I guess you describe them as a caulk gun that we invented this. So what well, is a massive caulk gun? But what we did is we got our, our restoration mortar, which is a mixture of local soil and sand and some bonding materials. I don't want to give out the secret sauce, but anyway, we've got our recipe and we shoot it deep into the wall, into the crevices. And that's what enables it to bond then. And then we, we brush it and we've got a wire brush. So it's, it's almost undetectable, but those walls will be there for, for many generations. Other, let's say archeologists, probably wouldn't have done necessarily that. And then they'll just sort of fall apart because of erosion and things like that. Right, and it's, it's so sad because, you know, this is evidence of God's work in history. And so we wanna take care of it. And I think people, people wanna fund those types of things. They want to know that their money is going to something that's meaningful like that. And we're really, really grateful for that support. And you mentioned uh, infrared and ultraviolet lighting. We have a lab in field where we literally examine our objects and our pottery. And we, I mean, we get like 2000 pieces of pottery a day and countless objects. And so as we examine them before anything is moved from the good pile to the bad pile, so to speak, we want to see it under different type of lighting because ancient writing may have been undetectable now to the naked eye. So we, we just add in another layer, any chance we can to make sure we're not missing anything. Yeah, let's talk just a little bit about that technology because I know you've got like a dark room atmosphere and you're using right. the, uh, special light and you're doing certain things to examine it. It's really, I mean, it, it's a great scientific approach to it. So explain a little bit about that. It's really interesting because archaeology is very low tech in one sense. I mean, it still takes human beings doing, you know, meticulous grunt work. But at the same time, we have our, our laptops in the field where we're entering data. I'm crunching numbers and making data-driven decisions. And we've got infra infrared and ultraviolet lighting going on and flotation going on in another area. And then there's wet sifting and saving samples, you know, to go to the lab. So it's very high tech in, in another sense. So um, I love to have people come visit. It's pretty cool because at Shiloh, we have like hundreds of visitors every day that come by because, you know, it's a tourist site. There's a lot of interest in Shiloh. And so 
uh, we're very happy to be able to show people what we're doing. In fact, we've even recruited volunteers literally from tourist groups going by. They have come back and joined our group. <laughs> no, really? Do people need special qualifications if they wanted to come to Shiloh this year uh, and bring their family? Uh, just explain a little bit about uh, what, what that might look like. Absolutely. In fact, this morning there was a big announcement out of Israel that July 1st, the country will be opening to individuals. So they're opening in a couple of days to groups in a limited sense. But we've been planning on the assumption that the country would reopen. And so uh, this morning's announcement puts a big smile on my face. So we can uh, register volunteers. We have a large group signed up even you know, with the tentative situation. It also appears that there's going to be a ceasefire uh, within the next 24, 48 hours, and things should calm back down pretty quickly in that part of the world. But all the information is at digshiloh.org. People can go there to register, to learn about the dig, the dates, the times, costs, and so forth. Uh, they can donate at the site as well. They can follow us this summer on Shiloh Network News. We have our own media team that's going to be putting out a bunch of creative stuff. We've got entrepreneurs like you and others that'll be coming by and shooting things. So just keep an eye on, you know, hashtag dig Shiloh and, or, you know, search my name and, and you, our associates for biblical research, and you'll be able to follow what's happening uh, in the field this summer. How, how do you fund these, uh, this work there at Shiloh? Well, as I said, I'm an evangelical, so I do it the evangelical way, <laughs> which is means I ask my friends and family for help. Um, I let people know what we're doing and ask them to consider giving to that. And people have been generous. And this is one reason why we have been able to do state-of-the-art stuff. And you know what, Tim, isn't it time that we as, as believers are leading, we're out front in technology uh, in an excellence and not not lead, trying to lead from behind. And uh, so basically we raise the money. Uh, I know some digs like Elat Mazar's dig in Jerusalem, she waited 10 years to launch until some big donor came along and wrote a massive check. Uh, we don't have an endowment or a university that underwrites us. We do have a consortium with a number of schools and groups that belong. So it's just individuals and, and groups that are making donations to us. And we're grateful for what you're doing through the Historical Faith Society. And um, I, I love the way that you described it. It's sort of like the PEQ, the old Palestine exploration, or PEF, the Palestine Exploration Fund that uh, saw the critical importance of funding archaeology. I mean, we cannot do what we do without volunteers and money. Right. And I don't know if our Historical Faith Society members know this, but you had a need. We participated in this and we're going to help you get what's called a UTV to be able to bring uh, supplies and people up and down uh, the hill because it's you know, a lot of weight sometimes carrying this up and down. It's hot. We had uh, uh, some of our uh, Historical Faith Society uh, members uh, step in and, and, and the membership uh, fees and that. And we were able to con contribute about ten thousand dollars to to helping you with the uh, funding of that, and we're we're happy to do that, so we can be a blessing to you. Well, it is a huge blessing, and so a big heartfelt thanks from me and my team to uh, you and to the Historical Faith Society for their generosity. This this. Um, we call it a gator, but uh, I first got the idea when I was in Minnesota at uh, the Mahoney Mansion, <laughs> and in uh, Tim's garage, there's this, what do you call them, an uh, all-terrain vehicle? Yeah, UTV, uh, yeah. Said, a UTV, I said, we must have that at Shiloh because we're constantly moving things around the site. It will just increase our efficiency. And so right. uh, we're able to, to, to get one in Israel and we're going to buy a new one so that it will last for years and we can take care of it. So uh, folks can stay tuned for cool pictures of us tooling around on it. Well, you know, a couple of things people need to know. Uh, yes, I live on a hill. I can see sometimes for probably six miles. Uh, one time I, I remember when we first moved there before all the trees were up, I could see fireworks from 14 different communities. But uh, that hill in Minnesota gets full of snow. And I had to figure out all sorts of methods. And finally, I just got that UTV with a plow and I can plow my, my, my way out of my driveway. Uh, uh, but uh, what I wanted to talk about, too, is that uh, you've got a lecture series that were uh, that when you came up that time uh, and you got snowed in and you ended up uh, staying with us for almost a week. And uh, we took advantage of that and we were able to create a lecture series. 
we've combined that with uh, some work that you had over at Northwestern, uh, an interview, and then with another interview with you and Brian Wood and David Roll uh, at the site of I. So we're looking at the site of I as well. So that's going to be this new uh, featured lecture series that you're going to be coming out with, both talking about Shiloh and then we're going to be talking about uh, the work that you did previously uh, at I. So that's going to be a, f a nice piece to, to have in, uh, for people to, to collect as they're, as they're building uh, their libraries of biblical and historical information. So a uh, question then is that I know you're with uh, uh, one of the main people of uh, Associates for Biblical Research and just wanted to talk about that. Tell us a little bit about that. That organization is much, uh, has been around for a long time. Uh, tell me about that organization. Well, it was founded in the 1960s by David Livingston in response to what we would call the problem of I, uh, after Joseph Calloway excavated at Tell, which was believed to be the site of I. He basically announced to the world that there was no evidence there um, supporting the Bible, in fact, that it contradicted the Bible. And so David Livingston founded ABR, I went back to school, earned a PhD in ancient Near Eastern archaeology, and he wanted an organization <clears throat> where like-minded people could come together and form a coalition to to do research and excavation in the land of the Bible. And so over these now more than 40 years, we have excavated three sites and act, and then done extensive research on two others. So we excavated Kerbet Nisia, Kerbet el Makater, and now Shiloh. And then we did extensive research at Jericho and Mount Ebal. So these conquest sites are our primary uh, area of interest. And so ABR is is into, I guess we're the only evangelical organization that um, is involved actively in field work. And we create an umbrella under which other universities like University of Northwestern in your hometown of Minneapolis, University of Pikeville, uh, Lee University and schools like that all come in under our consortium, our umbrella, and they're able to be involved in a meaningful way. Good. And and uh, if people from the Historical Faith Society, they could become members of Associates for Biblical Research too, because you're producing a lot of information, a lot of content. I know you have a lot of scholars uh, on your uh, on your platform, right. and and so. Uh, right. It's only fifty dollars. I mean, it's incredibly cheap, and we put out a quarterly magazine called Bible and Spade. Mm -hmm. It's sort of the conservative counterpart of of Biblical Archaeology Review, which is written by people who don't believe the Bible. <laughs> Here you have archaeologists and scholars who actually do believe the Bible writing these articles. So I think people would would love it, and they can go to our website, uh, BibleArchaeology.org. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And well, that's great. Well, Scott, uh, we're going to have more this month. Uh, uh, I've got uh, more programming that you're going to be involved with, and we've got. I'm looking forward to this panel discussion uh, that's coming up. Uh, we're going to be we're going to be talking about you know bi you know the, the challenges of archaeology, the Bible, and you know even political unrest. I mean, all the things that that you deal with when you're dealing with uh, a nation like Israel and you're doing archaeology and you're doing it in different areas, uh, there's a lot of different challenges that you're faced with. Well, thanks, Tim, for putting this together. Yeah, you're welcome, and we'll see you <laughs> later this month. Sounds good. <laughs>